Okay, so thanks, Greg. Uh, it's like my contract got renewed, like I'm thrilled. <laughs> we'll see what happens after this one. Um, but it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, to be back. Thanks for the hospitality. Uh, thanks, Vanessa, for your help, wherever you are, and Greg. And I'm really pleased to have my wife, Linda, here. Uh, she doesn't usually see me when I'm in my, you know, work mode, so this is kind of fun. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today or tonight is this, uh, well, when I was here two years ago, uh, it was a very broad talk about automation in general, and it was still sort of a new topic then. It seems like a long time ago now. Uh, but you could you know, do a very wide look at the cars and the trucks and this and that. But in this case, I wanted to zero in on this, this world of robots on the world, uh, robots on our roads. And just to have that catchy phrase, you know, robots on our roads disrupting mobility. You can find people saying that, but you can also say, really? Now, come on, really? Maybe, maybe not. So that's what I want to explore, what we'll explore together. Uh, we'll have some discussion later. The term I use for this is automated mobility on demand. It's nice and geeky, you know, AMOD. Uh, so we'll, we'll use that sort of terminology. And um, I want to just stay at a fairly high level. It's not about how well does the, this or that algorithm works. It's sort of what does it mean for our, our business models? What does it mean for our mobility um, in this world? So I'll start off this way. What are the domains of automation? Um, it's, it's really split into these, at least these three areas, but they have interesting interactions with each other. So we all know about faster cars. Most of us own one or have owned one. That's that private ownership. You know, your market is a retail market. The utilization is crazy low, and we've heard those sorts of stats. Something like 4% for the average car is actually in use. If you use an airline sort of metric, then it's seat utilization. Okay, so split that by four or six or something, and we're under 1%. But that's a world of its own. Heavy trucks, then you've got ROI is calculated, it's fleet owned, and there's very high utilization of these vehicles. And then the world we're talking about tonight, AMOD, Automated Mobility On Demand, <clears throat> it offers the opportunity to be very high technically <coughs> but fleet owned and high utilization and when something's fleet owned then you know the hands on maintenance and upgrades and such uh, can happen in a way that you you know a car gets sold by an, by an auto dealer and it's just gone you know if, the, if it gets an upgrade it's only because the driver or the owner has decided to do that that's not really the greatest place to launch the highest possible level of automation technology it's doable but it's a lot harder so one way to think about this is uh, what's, what's called the quadrants of mobility. I stole this from a, a guy at Morgan Stanley, Adam Jonas, who I'm going to quote later. Um, and it's just very simple. Here, here I'm owning the asset, I'm owning the vehicle, or I'm sharing it. Here I'm driving it, and here it's driving itself. So those are the four quadrants. So this is where we've lived for 100 years or more. Uh, we own it, we drive it, you know. When we go over here, we're in Uber, Lyft, et cetera, because somebody else is driving, but we, uh, but it's owned, it's privately owned. Um, or, well, I'm sharing it, excuse me, I'm reading that wrong. So when we get up to this area, owned autonomy, that's where Tesla, for instance, is saying, okay, you own it, and it's gonna drive itself, it'll drive you around. That's that world. And then this is really the most interesting area, the shared autonomy world. So. The asset's shared, I'm getting rides on something I don't own, and it's completely autonomous, it's driving me. And the, the business activity in this space is just really thriving and really bubbling. Um, smaller companies can get into that space in a way they can't get into this space, typically. So that's just a framework to think about these things. But let me speak, let me kind of take some fairly obvious information but structured a little bit. Why do we care about this? Well, I guess there's three ways to be mobile, at least on the ground. We'll forget about boats and planes. You know, I'm driving, somebody else is driving, or the computer is driving. So on this first one, I'm, dr I'm driving. Either I own that vehicle or I share that vehicle, right? Where car share has taken off. There were, wasn't that long ago, people were very skeptical car sharing would go anywhere at all, and it, and it has. Um, so what are, the, what are the hassles in this world? What are the costs? It's all very obvious, you know, if, if I'm driving, then I have to worry about parking. If I own, I'm worrying about vehicle maintenance, storage, fuel. Maybe I'm paying somehow, paying in fuel. And of course, because I'm driving, it's non-productive time. So that's the self-driven world. The other driven world 
uh, has been around a very long time with bus and taxi and this new thing, Uber, Lyft, etc., is mobility on demand. Somebody else is driving. So now the costs shift around, right? I'm not worried about all the, these things related to owning a vehicle, but I'm paying a fare and I may or may not have an advantage in non-productive time. We, you know, how many of you rode the bus to get here? How many of you ride the bus every day? Right, right. And how many of you paid a bus fare today? Well, actually you did if you pay taxes, right? Because that's what keeps the buses going for the most part. Uh, taxi, you know, most people are as price sensitive. A taxi is really not what you want to think about, and that's why Uber has been uh, successful. So this, these aspects, all these ownership aspects go away. Non-productive time varies, and paying a fare varies. And then, of course, yeah, well, so we're talking about there's analyses out there of something like 67 cents a mile for a, an Uber or Lyft type lifestyle. Other analyses say when we own our own vehicle, it's about a dollar a mile something like that. So, you know, if you commute or whatever, about a thousand miles a month, $670, you know, could be a car payment. Um, so that's, that's the cost, but it comes down. <coughs> and then the computer driven mobility, that's, uh, you know, your car is automated and you're accessing a, a service. The car is automated is what it should say. It's not that I'm owning it. Well, actually it could be either way. I could own this car that's automated or I could access somebody else's vehicle. So the same hassles and costs are there. Really we're down to either I'm owning it and I'm paying for it or um, I'm paying for some paying somebody else. And that's what we're talking about. The non-productive time goes away. Like I said, I'm taking things we kind of know, but I'm just structuring them, structuring them in this way. And I think the issue of non-productive time is really what's driving the market or to flip it to where it is productive time driving is productive time where it did not used to be. So here the analyses are something like 31 cents a mile. You can see other numbers. About less than half of that other number, 67 cents a mile to 31 cents a mile. So a little over 300 bucks if you go 1,000 miles a month. You know, not bad. <clears throat> so given that structure, given what we just said, this is the bottom line. Why do we care about this? We care because this automated mobility on demand minimizes that is, is the one combination of all those things I went through is the one that minimizes non-productive time and minimizes cost or maximizes productive time and value. So now I want to just tell you what's going on out there and how who, who's you know who's making this this pot bubble. We've got what I would say two two major worlds out there automated shuttles or what you would think, I'll give you some examples, they're moving, it's multi-person vehicles, eight or 10 or so uh, passengers. And then there's the on-demand automated vehicle, the robo-taxi. And they do share these common elements. It's street level, it's low speed, uh, generally in a very limited geographic area, so from a mapping perspective and uh, keeping track of your vehicles, frequent maintenance, you can, you can do those things. Let me say that one of the areas that's really starting to drive this is this idea of serving mobility challenged people um, in a way to give them mobility they've never had before. You've probably all seen the, uh, the Google video from quite a while ago of uh, Steve Mahan, a, a blind gentleman who, uh, whose Google took car took him to Taco Bell and he went to his cleaners and this and that. And you know, he had mobility and he's a great spokesman for this. So this is starting to catch on because, you know, everybody can say, oh, wow, that's a wonderful thing to do. It, it, it enlarges the conversation beyond, oh, I can just, you know, play around on my phone while I'm moving down the road. It, it gives it a little bit of nobility, I guess. So there's a program out there. There's a lot of things. I won't spend much time on this. But this, uh, this graphic, it looks like ALLRI, but it actually is ATTRI. <laughs> Accessible Transportation Technologies Research Initiative. How's that for a little lesson in the graphic design? <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a cool program. It's a USDOT program uh, that's been running for several years, and they're saying it's, it's not just about automation, but automation is, is a big piece. And here's these three really important constituencies. Persons with disabilities, kind of the traditional constituency, veterans with disabilities, and then older adults. So these three really come together as a, 
a customer base because they, in one way or another, face uh, limited mobility. Technology can fix that. That's the premise. That's the promise. So I invite you to Google that, check out the USDOT website. You can find out more. I'm involved a little bit in supporting this, and I can tell you more. So now I'll talk about these two, these two areas, automated shuttles versus the robo-taxi and, and how they distinguish from each other. These are out there, things are happening globally. Um, there's been a project in Europe, uh, the current one is called City Mobile 2, funded by the European Commission to uh, actually build these kinds of things. That's a City Mobile 2 vehicle that was operating in, uh, on the Italian coast, uh, running at about, gosh, really slow, you know. 10 kilometers per hour, something like that. But it was a very pedestrian intensive area and it helped people out uh, through that area. So there, this is the end of, or, or I guess the third phase of about 15 years work, worth of work in this kind of thing funded by the European <coughs> Commission. They've had that vision for quite a long time. Um, and so there have been trials where the, uh, the public rides in these vehicles. It's meant to help for primarily in pedestrian zones. In some cases, you're not even saving time. You could walk as fast or faster than these things. But people still like them because they, you know, they, if we know how the weather is in places in Europe, you know, you get out of the rain or the, the cold or you just want that productive time. It's as simple as that. Um, recently, uh, the UK got into it and they put about, I think it was 20 million pounds on the table and said, hey, we want stuff happening here. And uh, there was a process of uh, uh, proposal evaluation, and there's three projects running right now in Bristol, Greenwich, uh, Milton Keynes. Um, Jaguar is actually part of one of these. I forget which one. But in general, it's this idea of pod cars doing things in pedestrian zones or enhancing mobility. So there's things happening there. There's a little bit, of, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Singapore is a kind of a, a leader in this area. They have a neighborhood where they're applying uh, this sort of robo-taxi, or more of an automated shuttle activity. Um, they they want to really be leaders here. Florida actually has a shuttle operating in Tampa, uh, outside the Science and Industry Museum, and just taking people around. So the, any of these individually, if you were standing there and saw it go by, you'd say, well, okay, you know, big deal. But the point is that they're starting to, to bubble up, and Individuals, small startups can get into this space because you're talking about a, you know, small scale, small volume sort of thing. So the point I want to make about all this, at least so far, it's mainly been driven by private investment. And that's been the traditional world. And anything about carrying multiple people around who don't know each other has been the public transit world. Government money somehow, for the most part. And that's what's changing. So, I've got a few examples for you, just so you know what's the latest and greatest, what's going on. One of these little startups that I'm talking about is called Best Mile. Um, there was a, um, let's see. So this uh, study in Lausanne became uh, this activity in, in Switzerland, Sion, Sion, Switzerland, working with nine person driverless shuttles. Working with the university there, that's where this initial uh, uh, deployment was at EPFL. Um, the shuttle maker is actually a company called Navia, and they're working with the local bus operator. So this is this transit-oriented uh, agency saying, okay, we want to get into this space. They're running at 20 kilometers per hour. That's not much, uh, but they are capable of responding <coughs> to traffic signals. I'm not sure if that's through uh, Vita X exchange or uh, sensing, probably be the um, So they, uh, they're they right in the process of getting this going, certification testing happening now, and assuming that's successful, they'll have two vehicles circulating on, on public roads, and that's significant. This is not a completely protected, protected environment. Public roads starting soon, and then they want to understand, you know, how some of the players are studying how this how the system deals with the unusual situations. We all know something's going to happen. The system can't handle. The Vita X communications uh, make sense for adjusting speed. And you have these little simple situations where right of way is ambiguous. So the vehicle stops, and then some human driver stops, and everybody's waiting on each other. Uh, 
this is meant to study that. And the transit operator is just is simply asking, do these make sense? And does this mean that in isolated areas we can offer better transit service because the costs are so much lower? So that's one example. Here's another. This was just announced. The UK wasn't finished with that first round of funding. They, they launched another one called Flourish. Uh, one of the key focus areas is adapting and, and serving that aging society. They also want to you know, deal in some of the technical areas of cyber and wireless comms. And that's just a quick look at all the players involved. So it's, it's got a lot of, this public money is creating a lot of business activity. And then um, this next one, WePod. Anybody here that's done? All right, here I go. I'm going to try to say this. Look out again. Look out again. How's that? Look out again. That's my. Well, see, I knew, I knew, I, I should have asked for Germans, I guess, because these guys didn't do it. So, so who, who got it? Who said that? Wagenigen. Wagenigen. That. Wagenigen. There we go. Um, little project called WePod. Uh, this is on city streets. There's unprofitable routes, you know, that I think were canceled. This is an opportunity to read establish that sort of service. Two six passenger vehicles, I got a picture coming up. Uh, they, they're capable of running at 40 kph, but first uh, generation they're sticking to 25 kph. Um, and they're also staying away from rain and snow and night. Well, but you know you gotta start somewhere. So I'm sure the technology guys would say, hey, it's fine, but somebody has to approve it, right? And that's where it started. That's what it looks like, um, you know, sort of roomy, modern. Here's a picture, I think in a second I have a picture of the inside. Um, and here's something that's been happening, at least across Europe, this idea of what's been called a, a groom. You know how a groom takes horses around? There's a staff member on board who's just there in case something happens, uh, and usually is doing nothing. But they have a tablet and they can take control if they need to. But that's the sort of thing the public authority wants as an, within that time frame of an initial deployment. And it makes sense. But they also have three buttons on the interior. This is all I know about it. Three buttons to enable the passengers to brake the bus in case of emergency. I don't know if this is like a little braking, a lot of braking, or, or there's three to be within an arm's reach. I don't, I don't know. Um, so we have to go over there and see. What else? Uh, that this is the company here is Easy Mile, another startup. This is interesting. The liability's been defined to be with the owner, which is TU Delft. Those are always the thorny situations, but they want to get beyond their initial uh, services by getting to uh, this idea of a res reservation or hailing the the service, and in particular traveling this set route between the university and the, the train station, which is a distance such that it will really help the public around there. I've talked to the project leader about that one. So this is what it looks like on the inside. I don't know if that's too dim, but simple, clean kind of design. Button somewhere. <laughs> and then uh, just to throw in a little more, I think very recently at uh, maybe the December meetup was uh, Auro Robotics, I think they told me. But I just checked in with them. This is their uh, current, they're in the area here. This is their current vehicle another uh, shuttle type approach and this is their concept for what it might look like um, and I think you know this is like a scrolling item that gives someone from the outside some understanding of what this vehicle is about to do so the purpose in showing all these different things was there's a lot of variety out there it, it serves it, it fits well with the startup world because you can deploy these very really limited limited functional aspects and limited geographical aspects and there's public agencies who are willing to fund you at this point. Uh, for the most part, not in the U.S. Very little in the U.S. Uh, and then I want to include Baidu, even though I know very little about what Baidu is doing. I think that's their intention. Uh, but they've said this much in the in the press: the idea of creating shuttle routes running, um, you know, something like 20 mile routes. Uh, they believe that's achievable. Um, Planning to commercialize in three years and getting into this market. So now we're getting out of that public investment world, starting to get into 
big time private investment, even in the shuttle side of it. And this may or may not be a shuttle, maybe it'll be more of a robo-taxi. But now let's talk about the on-demand world. This is the robo-taxi version of AMOD. Um, you know, the aim out there become competitive with or better than car ownership. It is seen as a natural evolution by some car makers, and that statement would have been laughed at a few years ago, but that has changed a lot. I'll talk about that. Um, <clears throat> many folks becoming active, and the, the deployments here will occur when the public sentiment fits and the regulatory en environment is conducive. Where is there a population that wants this? That's not in every town, everywhere. A couple more points, you know, clearly we've seen what Uber in particular can do with their policy cloud, thanks to their deep pockets. Google has a lot of policy cloud in terms of working with public entities to uh, get clearance to operate these systems. So here, in contrast with the automated shuttles, we're talking about private investment. Very different world. So I'll let me step through a few of these players. Of course, I have great respect from Google. They're they're clearly in the lead in terms of starting first. I think they're in the lead in terms of uh, technical capability in this specific application. The car companies are very advanced in some of the other applications. And what's important is in last year they established, they went beyond research team to establish a business unit for this. They hired a guy who's an automotive industry veteran, uh, John Krasick, who was with Hyundai and um, Ford. So this, these are really significant movements. The, the testing has expanded beyond Mountain View. It's now in Austin, uh, Portland, and, I, and there's rumors of London. I'm not sure if that's, if that's solid or not. So Google's moving really strongly here. No surprise to anybody in the room. Uber is also moving strongly. They have uh, acquired a lot of technologists uh, in Pittsburgh, and they're also working with the University of Arizona. The word out there is that Uber's really want to move really fast into this space. Of course, they have an existing service, an existing brand specifically about mobility. Once they flick the switch, this is going to go fast, I think. Um, and there's talk that because of this relationship with the University of Arizona, they'll be uh, working with their, their mapping test vehicles. And not to leave out Japan, there's some things going on in Fujisawa. <coughs> Uh, it starts to sound similar as to what's actually happening, but the players are different. Maker of video games and uh, developer of automated driving technologies. Again, small companies. I don't know if they're small or not, actually. I just don't know the company. Um, so if this is the case. 50 residents have been uh, selected, and they'll be able to use this self-driving taxi on public roads. Um, that wasn't even considered a couple of years ago. From the, from the neighborhood to the supermarket, market, about three kilometers. Once again, we have a groom. An attendant will sit in the driver's seat for safety reasons. But I think that'll, that'll change as these things move themselves out. Really interesting area is what's happening with the automotive manufacturers, the OEMs. Uh, Daimler has said for a few years that they plan to uh, take their capabilities within the car side, the S-Class, the E-Class, they said they're going to move it to the truck side and also move it to their car share service, car to go. So they have one of the few. They are one of the few OEMs that has all three as a very strong activity and working in all those markets, and that will serve them well. General Motors. What was it? Just December when they said, "Oh, we're going to put, you know, invest 500 million in Lyft. We're going to roll with them. They're our partner." So that's going to make life interesting for Uber. Plus, they acquired the patents of Sidecar and their software, which was a, a bit obscure. It came and went quickly, but it was car sharing sort of activity. And this could make things, these patents, this IP could make things very interesting for anybody else wanting to get into that business. Um, we'll see. And then GM announced a classic car sharing service for college students, uh, city dwellers. So the action is there. Ford. It said, yep, we're in this too. They want to do this AMOD thing on their corporate campus. Uh, not a big deal, but they're making statements like this. Um, driver fully out of the loop by 2020, uh, as long as the weather conditions are conducive to it. Renault is leading a, a major French research program in this space. And um, Hyundai has been in the press with 
talks of major discussions with Google about being their uh, Google source for a, a vehicle layout which fits this idea of you know passengers in and out a lot. So it's a little different. Most back seats aren't used that much, but in this case they want that uh, to work. I think it was a Sonata that seems to be of interest. So a lot of activity, automated shuttles, small companies on the robo taxi, you got big companies, but companies that are scaling, they've already scaled up. Uh, it's interesting, Google, I respect them immensely. They've been around working this area for maybe eight years now. They've yet to put a product on the, on the market. I think they'll get there quickly. I think we're just getting to this tipping point. But it's interesting how the media holds up Google as if they are the leaders when they are leaders in some ways, but not in terms of product, where I give a lot of credit to the car companies. That's their world. So let me finish with a few thoughts on what does this look like? What's the pitch from a societal level uh, and then from a business level? I give a lot of talks on automation in general. A lot of times I have states and city people in the room, and they want to know what should we be doing? And the good news is they don't have to go and build special lanes. They don't have to build new infrastructure. But they do need to create a good, clear policy environment that protects the public, but is not too onerous that causes everything to collapse. That seems to be going okay here and there. The key thing is dynamic data. There's data that public agencies have, road agencies, that nobody else has. It's internal to their working, such as very simple things like traffic signal phase and timing. You can't just get that off the web. But if a world were to exist where you could get that off the cloud, it would be wonderful for all automated vehicles, save for work zones, but we know how unusual work zones can be laid out, and Google had their first crash, right? Sometime in the last couple of weeks, it just got announced. That was a work zone, marked with sandbags, I think, which I don't think I've ever seen sandbags marking some lane closure, but that was the deal. And I tell these public agency guys, system developers are ready to have these discussions, but it's, it's moving very slow in this space. You'll find individuals who want to move fast, but there's just lethargy in the public sector. I used to work there, I know. Um, and then we've got a study that was done by the National League of Cities looking at big future issues, what's happening out there, including what's happening in automation. And the interesting takeaway was you know, all the cities and states plan very far out. 2050 is not unusual. But even that far out, only 6% are taking into account this idea of automated vehicles. Uh, only 3% are taking into account even the current uh, mobility on demand services. So that's, that's the world in the public sector. But this was interesting. And several have done these kinds of studies. You know, what happens if we do a complete shift for an entire metropolitan region from private car ownership to AMOD, the Automated Mobility on Demand. What happens? International Transport Forum within OECD did this. They used actual travel data. They looked at the taxi fleet in Lisbon, Portugal, um, 2.8 million in the greater area. Their modeling, modeling parameters were, these were seen as, you know, reasonable service. No more than five minutes to maximum delay when I want to ride. No more than 20 minute, 20% 20 additional travel time, capped at 10 minutes including ride sharing with a cap at a two kilometer diversion. So here's the results. The mobility needs were served by 20, fewer than 26,000 of these taxi bots compared to the existing 203,000 cars on the road. That's modeling, you know, modeling's not perfect, but uh, that's an amazing result, it's 13% of the cars. Similar study was done for Singapore, um, it's out on the web somewhere, that had similar results. And um, why is that happening? And this is what it looks like graphically. Uh, they did a little bit more here. Before it was 13%. They added that with the taxi bus, they added public transports. There's going to be corridors in any city where buses make sense and they'll have good ridership. So add that in there with the taxi bus, then you're down to 10% of the vehicles. So that's pretty amazing. That's one reason the business people say there's something going on here. So back to Morgan Stanley, this guy, Adam Jonas. Anybody heard of him? He's kind of a name out there. He's the key automotive analyst for Morgan Stanley. He likes to talk in very punchy sorts of ways. He gets quoted a lot. Um, he, he talks up Tesla a lot in particular. So as he puts it, here's a few quotes. Automobiles are the most underutilized asset on the planet. 
So this, uh, this mobility market is the most disruptible on Earth. As he calculated, drivers rep driving represents 10 trillion in spending per year. Just adding up everything we, we spend on our cars and parking and everything else. So that is a market opportunity. He wants to make mobility so cheap that only the rich will own cars just because it's a novelty. It's kind of like anybody that owns a horse now, for the most part. <laughs> it's a novelty. It's fine. Go ahead, own a horse. Very few people are horse-centric about their mobility. <laughs> so, so here's what he, you know, he's using different numbers than what I quoted before. He sees the cost of mobility falling to 25 cents a mile, less than half the cost of operating a private car today, a tenth the cost of a conventional taxi cab. So he's running around talking about this $10 trillion market opportunity. I don't know if he's right or not, but he gets quoted a lot, and he is shifting the tectonic plates in the investment industry. A lot of people are listening to this guy. So what does this all mean? Does the automotive business as we have known it, does it change forever? Uh, if, if the car owners <coughs> jump in, they start selling to Google and everybody else, will the cars just become a commodity? Do you really care what brand of Uber car picks you up? Maybe, yeah, there's a, maybe there's a few negatives, but internally I think people don't care. Mm -hmm. um, so advice to the car companies that has been kicked around, one is to control the mobility ecosystem. In other words, just get out there and be a part of it instead of selling into it. Daimler, I think, is looking at that. As well as the strategy to design the best cars for shared mobility. Be the ones who, who uh, sell the most of those. Well, okay, to kick off our discussion, let me just get into a few challenges and questions. Kind of put this out already. Who leads uh, public sector or private sector, or both somehow? What is the role for these government players, if any? And where will this take home? You know, China has, has generally spoken of as having a more relaxed regulatory environment, or you might just say it's centralized. So with a, a couple of announcements, they could clear the way in a policy and regulatory sense for driverless cars to be fully uh, offered. Might go faster there. Is a regulatory push needed? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on the environment. The, the City Mobile project in Europe is actually drafting proposed regulations to submit to the European processes to get that formalized. Um, otherwise, in the past, projects like this have been uh, slapped with railway type regulations for safety, which makes the business case just evaporate. So they need their own sort of special, you know, uh, definitions of what's good enough. And of course, there's the issue of uh, public trust, customers' trust of the people in and around the vehicles. Um, and the thing I didn't talk about at all, it's a whole other talk, is this idea of package delivery, um, the local residential delivery, and how that will synergize with these robo taxis. Just a few more. Um, will a strong private sector market emerge for automated shuttles? Could be. Or maybe it'll be just little spots here and there. Um, and, and then the question is, you know, think about it. You've got your, your Uber, your Lyft, you enjoy it. How much do you care if there's a driver there or not? I mean, are you that price sensitive from, what, 60 cents to 30 cents a mile? Maybe not, and that's going to affect the, the power of this market once we get over the novelty of uh, the computer driving us. And there's plenty of technical things. One is this idea of teleoperation, create a, a control linkage to that vehicle so that when it gets confused, something strange, you've got a, a room where one guy is keeping track of like 40 different robo-taxis and he can step in, control for 10 seconds, deal with this funny thing that caused the Google car to hit the bus fender, and then he's out of it. So you can, that's very, I don't want to say very doable, but it, it is a good, a promising strategy. And certification and recertification are, are huge topics for cars, trucks, whatever. You get into this world where the, the, the public agencies like to think, okay, the vehicle's certified, done. Now we're seeing a world of continuous software updates. Does that require new certification every time? <coughs> And, of course, the big question, will our lives change forever? Um, who knows? But I'll leave it at that to uh, open up for some discussion. Thank you. So, floor's open. Questions? Comments? Yeah. So, this is what I do for my guest. So, uh, you know, you were talking about the shift happening 
I was wondering, like, I take Uber all the time and I talk to all the operators yeah. driving. Yeah, some too. of them are full time, they love it, they're so happy that they can just make money doing nothing and, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, what happens to their jobs? And, and of course, you know, the taxi drivers and the whole taxi industry, right? What, what's the thinking there? Um, what's I'm, I'm one of those hard hearted guys that <laughs> if technology advances, jobs go away. You know, I mean, that happened back when we transitioned from horses to cars. Um, but uh, any other opinions on that? I mean, what else can you say, really? <laughs> but, but you know, it's like all these, these sort of arguments like this. But somebody's winning, and the person who's winning are the people who are getting their mobility for less money. So there's economic benefit across society, even when there's an economic disbenefit, right? That works. Yeah? Just coming here today, we saw, you know, everyone going home from work, depending on which way you're going. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's lighter on one side than the other. I just wonder how these technologies, can we really get enough vehicles to take care of that peak load? Yeah. And right. it seems to me like that's a major number of miles a day, mm -hmm. rather than the smaller shuttles that are short distance that you could easily do by bicycle, things like that. Do you think that we'll be able to address that problem? Yeah, in the future, are we going to do mainly just the short distance shuttle type? Uh, well, the short distance shuttles are a simpler thing. You know, they have less of a headwind. Um, I think this modeling that I've referred to dealt with those peak surge aspects, the time of day aspects. Uh, but I think a lot more modeling is needed, a lot more understanding of that is needed. This also means, this world we're talking about means that you're going to have a lot of empty cars running around. Is that does that mean the roads are clogged with empty cars? You know, everybody goes into town, cars have people, they come out of town with no people. So they, these are open questions, they're valid questions. I think if I was a deployer, I would say, where does this fit? You know, where there's a nice synergy here, it, rather than trying to fit every, every place all the time. Yeah. So usually um, when you have a system with a weakness, uh, some people want to, uh, Go on to this weakness. Uh, for example, you can stand in front of the car, and the car cannot uh, react as uh, flexible as a human yeah. driver could. So, uh, how can this problem be solved? Mm. Yeah, if you couldn't hear, the question is what about folks who want to play with that car and stand in front of it, mess with it, right? Um, it's one of those questions you, you can't give it a definitive answer. It's, I think it's about doing the trials, doing the deployments. Uh, one of the earliest trials was in the Netherlands, um, park shuttle sorts of applications, and they didn't see much trouble after, you know, one or two incidences in the first few weeks, and that was it. And from what I've heard about these European deployments where this has happened the most, people just walk by. But you, you can always have, what, teenagers or whatever who are going to play around. Yeah. But if you're in a bad area, the possibility would be higher. So, uh, yeah, if you're in a nice area and you, have, uh, you give it a try, the people maybe are nicer. Yeah, um, that could affect where the service is offered, or it, it, but my, you could say maybe Uber won't go in those bad areas, but they do apparently, you know, even with the risk. There are some serious problems with saying that, that oh, we won't go in that area because it's bad. And the well, I, I know, you know right. Is yeah, it's just it's kind of unacceptable. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, taxi companies have been sued for not serving areas. Right, right. But apparently, Google has improved. Uh, uh, Uber has improved upon that world. Even the you know, taxis are bound to serve those areas. But excellent. Uh, the question I have is: uh, so you say you need, like, say, ten percent of the cars right, to do all the transportation, but that's, that doesn't mean you have less automized traffic. You just drive more per car. Right, but right, right. You right, right. Them more efficiently, right? Yeah. But the question is that they don't really have any impact on traffic unless get more people to share each car, right? which means I have to be willing to share my trip with someone else. Right. Do you see any trends in that direction? Because otherwise, there's no <coughs> yeah. benefit, right? Could you hear that back there? I'll repeat. No. Yeah, if you repeat the question. Right? Yeah. Um, the, the, the point that, uh, you know, the vehicle miles traveled are staying pretty much at the same level, if not higher. And so it only really starts to work when people are sharing that mobility. Um, it's an open discussion right now, and now that we have Uber Pool, it's a great test for that. You know, I've, they pushed it at me, and every time I push back, no, I won't Uber, you know, Uber X. But I'm, I'm this close to saying, okay, I'll try it. I'll do Uber Pool. So it's going to be a societal shift if it happens, but it may not happen. 
Yeah. That, that's pretty much acceptable in the city, in the urban environment. But the city like here, but we are way part of the San Francisco. Yeah. You know, it's a different story. You know, um, in terms of that, if you um, such as uh, you know, all the transportation need or ten percent can shrinking down, then what happened to all, all the automotive industry? And then some other issue is uh, some people, hey, I like, I like to share, but I also want to have my own lower, more lower mm -hmm. car. So yeah, that's yeah. Type, kind of you know demand also. Mm -hmm. It, it will not be one monolithic thing. There's people in rural America, certainly, who this doesn't make a lot of sense. So, and people who just, if they're wealthy enough, they just want their own vehicle in the garage. So, uh, Dan. Dan. Okay. So there's a lot predicated on the fact that the customer will pick on cheapest not going to make a rational Okay. There's a lot predicated on the fact that a customer is going to make a rational decision to pick the cheapest option. We know that's not how customers make decisions today. They make decisions emotionally. You know, the Model T got out sort of by Chevy not because the Chevy was cheaper; it was three times as much. But it appealed to their vanity with colors and more fashion. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I think there's the ideal customer that we would think would be rational, and then there's what real customers are in the real world. And how do you think that reality? Can yeah, be? I mean, let me ask: What if these four-wheel rubber tire things that moves around? What if it just became a commodity? Would, would you miss that? Would you would you care if you still got your mobility? I mean, who, who would be just perfectly okay with that? And who's on the other side? It's like, no, I want my really cool ride. Well, I knew you would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's, I don't know what it was, half and half. Um, that's going to be one to watch. Yeah, and yeah, right? But I, I think there's different kinds of experience, right? It's like you bike to work or you bike on the weekend with your one time. pointed out that uh, our taxpayer money is going into a lot of subsidy to transit today. You spend a lot of time with the public sector. You've already pointed out that we may have a very different utilization of, of shuttle vehicles, which could include transit. Do you think it'll be privatization there? Or do you think we'll get to a point where the cost per mile is low enough that we don't need to subsidize? How does that play out? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. It, it's hard to imagine you know, pri public transit phasing out. It's also hard to imagine that whole industry being so innovative they adapt all of this stuff. Um, it's a sluggish industry. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah? Uh, uh, one comment and then one question. On, on the employment um, question, I think if you think of the really extreme um, shared ownership, then there's a lot more than just the drivers that go away, potentially. There's the dealerships, there's the car washers, all the other services for private cars which is interesting to think with. My question was on the design of the car. If you could say a little bit more about what, for the A-Mods, um, you mentioned um, Hyundai because of the good back doors. So is there an assumption that we're going to have multiple car riders in the same car? Because right now the reason you're in the back is because there's a driver in the front. So why do you uh, need yeah, a good back door yeah, if right. you don't have a driver? It's a good question. And of course, uh, Nissan has the taxi, you know, purpose-built taxi in New York City. It's even more perfect for that. Um, uh, good question. I, I don't know. I don't know. But on that issue of uh, the jobs, et cetera, the dealerships going away, I mean, if you take that kind of mindset, then you say, well, gosh, now we've had this technology that can avoid crashes. Isn't that great? The crash rate's going to go down. It's going to be on all these cars. Oh, man, all those lost jobs in the hospitals. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we're talking about. And the insurance industry is going to shrink, too. There's going to be fewer auto insurance agents. The organ transplant people are already worried, actually. What? <laughs> the organ transplant people are uh, concerned. Yes. So I'm just wondering, I mean, say that consumers might not buy a car because it's cheaper when there's a red one. But 
what proportion of total traffic is B2B traffic, right? Yeah. And, you know, uh, and that includes like rental cars that you might pick at the airport and all kinds of other things where, yeah, I mean, you do buy, you do go to go to Florida and you get the cheapest possible Hyundai yep. because yep. it's $14 a day versus 150 for the, you know, Jaguar, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, some people don't want the Jaguar, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of the traffic out there that is based on somebody doing a spreadsheet and saying, this is where we're going to go, and won't that, through downward pressure from insurance companies and everything else, sort of shut down some of the more expensive options where they have to pay out more where the, the well, services are just available. I'm just wondering what the proportion is of B2B traffic. How much yeah. of the traffic out here, much less yeah. in New York City much or is wherever, B2B. is, is well, you're going to have that, taking lunch around? Yeah, the, the B2B is going to react to this in ways that make sense. You know, they, that's their world. The consumer, that's, we're all watching and see what happens. Yeah, Paul. Yeah. You worked with the Department of Transportation and you talked, I thought it was really interesting to hear you talk about the state planning is hearing this as well. Um, with all of the autonomous designs going on, you mentioned that the state planning is done way in advance, 2035 to 2050, and only 6% of the states are considering this right now. Is that going to have an impact on uh, autonomous designs being able to, without the states involved, you're not taking it. Yeah. There seems to be a disconnect between you know, the funding and then where the states are. Well, yeah, you know, I was involved in what was the USDOT's automated highway system project in the 90s. It was a huge deal with General Motors and Carnegie Mellon and Caltrans and others. And, and back then, we needed the public sector to act in order to make this happen. The vehicles were very smart, but we needed a little bit of help, you know, magnets in the road, if you remember that idea. If you haven't seen uh, Demo 97, Google that. Demo 97 was when fully automated vehicles ran up and down I-15 in San Diego. That was that program. Um, and we come, but, but the difference back then was we had to deal with all of these things because it was a government-oriented program. We had to deal with social equity and possible loss of jobs and all these things. Whereas when it's a, privately, a private sector push, you just need one person happy and that's the customer who buys it, right? Um, so it's a... It's not a new topic to the public sector. Uh, it's a very collaborative world, and they talk and talk and talk a lot, and we get a little movement, and then they talk and talk and talk, and it's, it's slow. Uh, but there, there's a, a public policy workshop that's now, or an ongoing set of workshops sponsored by the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. Uh, it's, so it's, it's moving. But the good news is the auto industry or the automation industry is not dependent on the public sector to spend big money to do things in the physical world. The main thing is do things in the policy world, which is a lot cheaper. Yeah. Since a local car, just a couple more questions. A couple more. Yeah. Um, you know, we just see the, some, uh, you know, the utilization of the car just shrinking down to ten percent. But uh, um, you know, for automotive industry, OEM, or some other related industry, car, robo car can be not only transportation mean, it can be also used uh, home computing sources. It can be uh, some kind of transformer style. Oh. Multi-purpose, yeah, that's that's true. And of course, it can double as a freight delivery. You know, yeah. you're not using it. Yeah, the transformer. I think is a good way to think of it. Um, yes. Um, so just on the topic of, of uh, replacing humans in systems, um, I think it's worth remembering that uh, the reason that Uber is taking over the taxi industry at the moment is because of, in large part, how bad the drivers were. Yeah. Um, they were they were disorganized. They were not. It was not necessarily safe. Um, you couldn't rate your driver. They they didn't have a reputation to uphold. Uh, and Uber is taking over because they're putting in a rating system and they're making the drivers better quality and more accountable. And to take it to the next step of maybe you don't want to have to have the conversation with the driver while you're going to the airport, you're going to get some work done. Or like my Uber driver came and honked their horn in front of my neighbor's house uh, yesterday when they came to pick me up, which they never should have done. Right. Uh, so uh, replacing uh, some of these jobs is actually quite beneficial for, for safety reasons. 
Uh, and also, if you haven't tried Uberpool yet, go try it. Uh, I, it's, I actually prefer it when I'm in San Francisco because it's cheaper. Can you, can you explain what Uberpool is? Uberpool is a ride share service in uh, San Francisco where other, other strangers are in the car when you take your ride. It usually caps out at about 6 or $7 to get across the city or something like that. It's pretty cheap. Uh, it's a little bit slower than the normal system, but I actually like it when I'm not in a hurry. I take uh, the standard Uber when I'm in a hurry and then ride yeah. share. The yeah. and it's kind of fun. You get to talk to strangers. I could say, you know, <laughs> what was that last? You get to talk to strangers. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> and they're they're pre-qualified. Uh, 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 pre 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 My daughter actually <laughs> uses Uber Pool in Philadelphia, yeah. but she finds that she doesn't actually have anybody else in the vehicle a lot of times, so it ends up being very cheap, but she gets the same ride. Uh -huh. There you go. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, now imagine your, your Uber interface, that's the one I'm most familiar with. There's Uber Pool and Uber XL and this and that. And there's Uber AV. You know, and you're going to have a choice. And would you care? Would I care if it's a driverless car versus a human-driven? Probably not. If there's no big cost difference, it's just a cost equation. I still just want to sit in the back seat, work on my stuff. You know, so that's uh, who knows how strong that market will be. Okay, let's go ahead and, and wrap that. up. Thank you very much. Richard. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you for the good questions and for attending, and be on the lookout for the recording, um, at which we hope to post soon, and uh, otherwise we'll see you next time. Thank you. Right.